Hey guys, Thomas Busby here again with a video that has taken more work and time than any other video I've done so far. Now while last week's video had a pretty bold title, in this one it's kind of like the encore to that 12 episode series of working out what is the best wide angle lens for the Fujifilm system. But in this video I'm going to share how I came to all those conclusions, all the facts I can, how I did all that testing, so you can work out what is the best wide angle lens for you. Now I say for you because the subject of the best is very subjective and to work out what is the best wide, well there are a lot of different little subcategories inside of the term wide. There are the super wides, zoom wides, prime wides, travel lenses with a wide angle option, even just what are the budget, best budget lenses with wide angle options. And like I said, whatever one is best is very subjective. So before we get into dishing out any type of award, let's work out how I came to all these conclusions. First of all, lenses. To work out which one is the best, I'm going to need a copy of every single wide angle lens available. So I sang out to Fujifilm and they were kind enough to send me one copy of every single lens with an 18mm or less option. Now I'm aware from a bunch of comments on last week's video that many of you feel that 18mm isn't wide. But from working in the camera industry for 10 plus years, Many people just starting out in photography have only ever experienced 18mm as the widest they've ever gone to, or as 18mm is as wide as they can afford. So I decided to draw the line there and let you, the viewer, remove as many not wide enough options as you feel apply to you. Better to be more inclusive rather than less. So next up was a way to measure and score all of these lenses. See, for all these reviews and this review video, I wanted to remove as much personal opinion as possible and share only the facts. It's just as much measurable data I could so you could decide what is the best lens for you. So, what are the facts? First up, a couple of easy ones. Weight. This wasn't going to change no matter what I did to each lens. This is an easy measurable fact. So too is if it's weather sealed or if it is not. Next up was price. Now this is going to change over time, but for the sake of scoring, I looked up the cheapest possible price from all your usual reliable retailers and compared all 12 lenses on one day. I removed cashbacks, large temporary sales and the second hand market, all little to be variable to give to scoring. Once I'd gotten all those prices from each lens, I compared them. So they don't get any points as based on their price, but they were getting points based on how they compared to the other Fujifilm wide angle lenses. A comparative score rather than a dollar value score. Then I came up with weights for how important I felt the aperture and wideness were for each lens. And then I had to give a score for zoom. See, prime lenses aren't gonna get any extra points in this section. To zoom in, I think has some versatility to it. Prime lenses, like I said, no extra points, but to ignore how useful having a zoom is, I think deserves some reward on its own. If I didn't have any points for zoom as a factor, then prime lenses were absolutely gonna clean this whole scoring up and sharpness. So to give some extra credit for zoom, I think was required. Next up was aberrations and astronomical performance. So for those that haven't already seen that video, check out the link up here or down in the description below. But if you do head over to my website and my Instagram page, then do note that those cheat sheets and the scores for each lens has changed a little bit. Don't worry, I do have an updated video coming on this, but just as I've tweaked my algorithm a little bit, just the recommended settings for each lens have adjusted just a small amount, but don't worry, where each lens sat and how each lens was tested hasn't changed as those results are still flawless as far as that rank goes. For those wondering, aberrations were measured in the far most focus pointed corners on the X-T4. This was the only way to remove focusing areas from the equation and it counts for 92.4% of the frame as everything further in from those corners only gets better. And I managed to get a 97.2% accuracy as far as how accurate I managed to position each individual star across all 12 lenses on the sensor. So it's a really accurate test but it doesn't count for 100% for those that are hyper picky but still 97.2% accurate I think is good enough. Finally, onto the biggest factor, which had more weight than nearly all of those other factors combined, which was sharpness. To measure this, I created a studio sharpness test which measured different densities of lines per millimetre. Now my original chart had was far too overkill, so I set a ceiling and a floor for what I felt was acceptable for printed images. So if you're doing a lot of web-based content, be aware that a lot of this information and a lot of the graphs that are coming up later on and in my other review videos are very much overkill for web-based, but if you're printing, this is good information. So my ceiling was what I thought was still overkill, but great if you're doing huge massive prints or you like quite a bit of croppability, and the bottom is what I'd consider it turns to mush when you print. So you can get softer and you can get sharper, but with the limitations of a 26 megapixel Fujifilm sensor, I thought anything outside of these was just excessive or a complete waste. 
But how much sharpness do you really need? Well, I'm going to cover that off a little bit more in next week's video of primes versus zooms. If you'd like to see that, feel free to hit that subscribe button. It's an easy way to stay informed about what's coming up next in my channel. But before I could start shooting this lens sharpness test, I had to remove as many variables as possible. So the first was pretty easy. I just set this big massive light up at full power at the exact same distance for every single lens test, just so lighting would be consistent and wouldn't be a variable. We then used a very solid tripod and locked it off on a two second timer just to try and remove as much camera shake as possible. Manual focus with a 10 times zoom on the back of the screen just to really remove focus inconsistencies from the test. Refocusing for every single shot, including if I was on shooting the corners or the center of each shot. I did a few pre-test shots with IBIS and IS on and off to see if that made any difference. And to be honest, from all the testing, I couldn't see any difference between having the IBIS and IS on or off. But as everything was so controlled, I decided to leave those factors off just to be safe. And this one might seem a little bit controversial, but I shot everything in JPEG instead of RAW. Now you will definitely get sharper results if you shoot in RAW rather than JPEG, but RAW requires a third party conversion software to get its result. And that third party has some variable to it. So an easy way to remove that third party variable was to shoot everything in JPEG. I'm after a consistent way to compare, not trying to find out how to get the sharpest possible results. I want consistency, not maximum variation. So removing that third party code variation from it was the best way to get more consistent results. Next up onto variation of lenses. Now Fujifilm only sent me one of each, so I borrowed as many different lenses as I could over that three to four months of testing just to remove any types of variation. See when doing my tests and getting my overall chart, if I suddenly got a drop in performance, there was three possible reasons to it. One, I had bumped the camera. Two, the lens was damaged. Or three, if multiple lenses gave that same drop in performance at the same spot, then it was just a flaw of the lens and was measured. But sadly, I was not able to remove every single variation from this test. At best, I was only able to test two or three lenses of each lens. And I came up with a, a variation I couldn't get my head around, which was the scaling of each chart as I positioned around the shot in variation to how wide and the different distance of the lens element from the sensor. The only way I think to get around this was to have each chart scale in size depending on how far away it was from the lens based on how far away that front or the different elements are from the sensor. This is really complex and I couldn't think of a way other than like having that robotic arm and an algorithm to scale and shift everything. However, just like real life, my test accounts for a variation in distance based on real world examples. I went as wide as I could, I positioned those charts in the corners and in the center at every different zoom range and every different aperture. Now I mean every single one. So for all 12 lenses, I took multiple shots at every different aperture at every major zoom range. And by major I mean it depends on what's marked on the lens. So this one has 16, 23, 35 and 55. It's the 16 to 55. I got as close as I could and the reason I went to those marks is so it was easier for you to replicate later on. The more marks on the lens, the more shots I had if it wasn't just a prime lens. As prime lenses are easily a bit easier as all I had to do was shoot the corners, refocus for every single one and shoot the center, refocus for every single shot at every single aperture. So this took a lot of photography. So once I'd taken hundreds and hundreds of photos at all those different apertures and zooms. I then loaded all those images up on a 4K screen and measured the different densities of lines per millimeter. With my 14 different stages, I could get a score of one to 14 with all the decimal points in between of how sharp a lens was at that particular way. I then took all those different scores and loaded it into an algorithm to get an overall score of how sharp each lens was. Plus it also gave me the graphs of the different levels of sharpness throughout the different zooms and aperture ranges for every single lens. Okay, so with all this measurable data and algorithms inside of algorithms, I managed to come up with a scoring system that you can see at the end of every single lens review video that is linked down in the description below and on your screen right now. And as you can see, after all that, using the TB photography algorithm, the 16mm f1.4 is the best. It is by far the brightest, it is weather sealed, it is averagely priced and weighted, it is the king of astro, but most importantly is the only lens to get optimal sharpness on the corners. No other lens got that full 14 points as far as corner sharpness goes somewhere along its aperture, or not zoom in this case, range. But, and this is a pretty big but, you will have noticed throughout all of this spiel I've not talked about how much weight I've put behind each bit of measurable data. And despite my best efforts to keep these reviews as factual as possible, the overall algorithm still has a lot of my personal opinion 
to it. And so while each lens was then measured and it had to that same algorithm applied to it evenly, what suits me might not suit you. So really, the best way to find out what is the best overall wide angle lens is to present you just with as many facts as I possibly can and let you decide for yourself which one suits you the best. Okay, so first up, let's have a look at the super wides. In this category, I feel there are really only two major contenders, the 8-16 to and the 10-24. to And as far as which one is best for you, I reckon I can simplify it down to one question. Are you making a living from photography? See, the 8-16 to isn't that great at 8mm and 16mm, but if used as a 10-24, to it is very reliable, very consistent, and weather sealed. The 10-24 to definitely lacks that weather sealing option, but it has a far broader zoom range to it, especially when you consider this is only optimal from 10 to 14 millimeters. However, the downside of the 10 to 24 is that it is inconsistent. At 10 millimeters, corners are soft. At 11, they sharpen up again. At 12, they drop down in softness again. And the inconsistency can be very frustrating if you're getting paid to do a job and speed is of an issue. So if you're making a living, the 10 to, sorry, the 8 to 16 is very much worth the extra bit of coin. However, if you are not, if you are just more of a hobbyist then the 10 to 24 is the one to get but you're going to have to accept that you eventually you're going to get a ceiling hit this little bit of a wall you're going to have to punch through where you need to slow down with your shooting you're going to have to really dial in the perfect shots you're going to have to do some reshoots just to get that optimal level of sharpness just due to the inconsistency of the 10 to 24. Okay, so next up we've got the best travel lens with the wide angle option. And once again, two major contenders the 18 to 135 and the 16 to 80. Now, if you remove price, wideness, and astronomical performance from my TB photography algorithm, the scores for these two still come out really even. So, no matter which one you want for travel photography, neither are going to disappoint you. They both have their pros and cons. Though, if I personally had to pick, I would go with the 16 to 80, just due to at 16 millimeters as a wide angle option, this gets a far better result than the 18 to 135 does at 18 millimeters. So, both are fantastic for travel. My personal preference, just due to this being a better wide angle option, would be the 16 to 80 for travel with a wide angle option. Best zoom lens with a wide angle option. So if you remove price and wideness from the TB photography algorithm and ignore the 8 to 16 because that's in the super wide category of all the zoom lenses you can get the best is easily the 16 to 55 that little red badge really represents a huge level and consistency as far as a zoom option goes it is a little bit heavy but as far as like I said zoom options there's nothing better than the 16 to 55 f 2.8 Best budget lens easily goes to the 15 to 45. It's definitely got some flaws to it, but as far as optical performance goes for its price, this thing kicks ass and smashes most of the other far higher priced lenses as far as optimal performance, optical performance goes. As far as best prime lens goes, once again, the 16 millimeter F 1.4, this thing's gonna be taken out of a lot of categories. We're not gonna talk about this too much. If you'd like to know far more about the 16 millimeter F 1.4, check out my review video for it up here or down in the description below. It kicks ass, best prime, best budget, 1545, awesome lenses. But once again, all these scores and awards are still based on my opinion about how important I feel certain weights are in an algorithm I made up. And I know I said I wasn't going to talk about how much weight I was putting behind each factor, each bit of measurable data for my algorithm. So I feel there's really only one way to work out what is the best for you, and that is to share some of those weights, which is the sharpness score of how well each lens does in my Lens Studio sharpness test. So removing all factors from the equation, lenses stack up like this. Well the top spot once again going to the 16mm 1.4 and I know I've mentioned this already but the 16mm 1.4 is truly in a whole other league as far as sharpness goes. Next up the 8-16 to has been knocked way down the list and taking its place as the 16-55 to which for a zoom lens to be so high is truly stunning. But, <laughs> man I love dropping some butts in this video. All those sharpness scores are still considering every single range and aperture of each lens. And if there's one thing I've tried to stress and get across throughout this 12 to 14 episode wide angle lens review series is that you don't use f22 and you don't use some of those extreme settings. So, if we ignore the, the, the crap and just look at the optimal settings for every single lens, things change up again. With the following five lenses pretty much all drawing for second place. We're going to just ignore the 16mm f1.4. It's the best. We're looking at what does phenomenal in that that second place drawed position. So a massive congratulations goes out to the following five lenses. The 16 to 80 at 16 millimeters, the 15 to 45 at 15 millimeters, the 14 millimeter f2.8, the Samyang 12 millimeter f2, and the 16 to 55 at 16 millimeters. 
Okay, but please, please remember to get those kind of scores, to get that level of performance, you can't use those lenses as advertised. You really need a dial in the right settings. You need to have good light, a steady tripod. Do as much as possible to remove camera shake. Now you focus, and for the love of God, please don't cheap out on your printing. But in saying all that, perfect overkill, over-the-top sharpness isn't the be-all and end-all. It is not required to get the job done. What is the best wide-angle lens for you can truly only be answered by you. But hopefully all this information and all these facts will help you decide what is the best wide-angle lens for you. If you'd like to know more information about every single one of the lenses mentioned in this video, please check out the links down in the description below as I've gone into far more detail about each individual lens. I do all this testing completely unsponsored and free just because I love sharing the information with you guys. If you'd like to support what I'm trying to do here, feel free to hit that subscribe button. If you haven't already, turn on notifications. You'll get notified when I release more videos like this. And if you can share this video with your friends, it would just be that nice little bit of support to help me keep the lights on. Thank you very much for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you have any questions, please let me know down in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them for you. But otherwise, until next time, I need to think of a new series to do.